<laughs> well, hello there. Are you lost? Better come with me. I will lead you through these dark woods. Trust me. <laughs> Don't worry, traveler. You have nothing to fear. For here, there is nothing but fear. Welcome to nothing but fear. The place where the moon laughs cruelly down upon us in this forest of horror. The place where your fears are exposed. Hello friends, welcome to episode 2 of Nothing But Fear. So glad you could join me again around the campfire. It would appear that your fear of moon and fang from our last adventure together hasn't been enough to keep you away. And I am wickedly glad. <laughs> I trust your trip in Master Danielson's carriage was not so eventful. Castle Danielstein is an utter ruin, its grounds even more so. I can't begin to guess what old Danielson is doing there, keeping the lights dim and room so cold. A fire's literally in every grate, and yet there is no warmth to speak of. But here, at least, we have fire and company, and food if you remember to bring some again. Breen Garen might bring her famed gingerbread if we're in luck. Truly, Prometheus and the Hellenic Pantheon would be proud. Speaking of Hellenic gods, everyone naturally remembers the tragic account of Arachne and her irrevocable hubris. What one wins in the weaving will spell doom in the aftermath. And thus we have the spider. <laughs> yes, you knew I would go there with the show. The spider, secretive, diabolic, powerful, patient, and the focus of tonight's episode. I must confess that, though I do enjoy frightening my guests with my podcast's subject matter, I myself have a terrible fear of arachnids. For real, I cannot look at a spider picture for long before I have to look away. Imagine the terror our protagonist faces in our first story, when he comes face to face with a creeping evil from deep and dissolute jungles. Let me begin the show with the horrifying account of the African Boana Spider. Dr. Tweed, so nice to finally see you again. I trust you have many stories to tell me about your adventures in the deep heart of Africa. Dr. Tweed beamed with sheer delight as he greeted his colleague at the door. A red bow tie attached to the top of his khaki blazer gave the fellow an eccentric yet scholarly appearance. The old man squinted through his bifocals while beckoning Robert to the table where two cups of hot tea had already been poured. Robert, my good man, he began. Yes, yes, of course. Join me for some tea and I shall regale you with a tale regarding the most curious creature this old man has ever had the pleasure of coming across in all his years of gallivanting around the globe. A friendly exchange of smiles and a pleasant handshake later, and the two men had taken their seats. So, Doctor, tell me about this mysterious creature of yours. Dr. Tweed's eyes lit up like a pair of bright blue sapphires. Ah, yes. 
the African Boana spider. Named after the indigenous people who reside in a section of the jungle where the creature originally hails. <laughs> it's a massive arachnid. I dare say the thing is uh, about half a meter in diameter. But that's not even the most interesting tidbit about it. G good God, man, Robert gasped. I beg your pardon, Doctor, but I'm, I'm I'm finding it quite hard to swallow that your interest in the tremendous girth of this spider would be eclipsed by an even more fascinating factoid. The old man's lips curled into the slightest smirk upon hearing Robert's retort. Oh, <laughs> but eclipsed it is, my dear friend. Perhaps you will understand once you hear this remarkable anecdote. On my twenty-first night of exploring the Dark Continent, we found that one of our pack mules had begun demonstrating bizarre and erratic behavior. The beast had started to crow and moan, as though it was suffering from some sort of horrible illness. Our guides had previously warned our party that the primeval forest we made camp in was rife with poisonous asps adders, and members, along with other deadly serpents, so I naturally hypothesized that it had fallen victim to one of the jungle's venomous vipers. However, upon further examination, I could find no evidence of teeth marks on the animal. No wounds, no pricks, not a single thing that would indicate it had been attacked. Sounds like quite the conundrum, Doctor. <laughs> Indeed it was. Even more curious was the fact that, though I found the animal's behavior to be somewhat unnerving, many of our party's guides seemed to be downright terrified. At the sight of the mule's predicament, a few of them even ran off from the campsite and into the darkness of the untamed jungle by themselves. <laughs> the fools! I loaded my rifle in order to put the creature out of its misery, as it was writhing on the ground and seemed to be suffering quite considerably. But before I had the chance to pull the trigger, my eyes witnessed a truly incredible sight. N no, Doctor, y you're not about to say... Oh, but I am... Out of the animal's mouth crawled the bow on a spider. Dr. Tweed took a sip of his tea. Robert could tell by his friend's reaction that it was still a bit too hot to drink. Mm. Well, like I said before, it was colossal. <laughs> I do love Earl Greyer. I suppose I should let it cool a bit more before I enjoy it, though. <laughs> But anyway, like I said before, it was colossal. Now, while I haven't quite figured out how the giant thing was able to contort its body enough to crawl its way out of the beast's jowls, I do have a theory about what it was doing there in the first place. Tweed paused a moment for dramatic effect, reveling in the sheer mystery of his account. Well, well, out with it then. I must say, good doctor, that I am I'm absolutely enthralled by this story of yours. Y you must tell me what happened next. <laughs> As it turns out, this particular species of arachnid has become quite feared by the natives. Hence the reason why some of my party's guides had chosen to take their chances among the ferocious wildlife and poisonous flora of the jungle, instead of staying at the camp once they realized what was behind all the ruckus. The remaining guides insisted that I shoot the spider. But you know me, Robert. I am a man of science. And what kind of academician would I be if I ended the life of such a spectacular specimen? An anthropod of such astonishing peculiarity must be studied. Alive. Robert interjected once more. B but Doctor, you still haven't explained what it was doing inside the mule's mouth. 
Have patience, my good man. All will be revealed in time. You see, the natives believe this spider to be some sort of soul-sucking demon. One that feasts upon the very life force of a man, bleeding him dry until he becomes nothing more than a withered husk. Obviously, an educated bloke like myself would dismiss such notions as nothing but foolish superstitions. But I do believe these primitive myths were onto something. Nevertheless, there is always a scientific explanation for these things. From my brief encounter with the creature, I have gathered that the eight-legged Goliath has evolved the most extraordinary of survival tactics. It appears that the spider entered our mule through its oral cavity. From there, it may have attached itself in some way to the beast's nervous system, granting it full access to the mule's movements and vocal patterns, essentially rendering the animal a useless puppet. What I'm saying, Robert, is that this creature was wearing our unfortunate ungulate like a hat on Sunday, and all of us were none the wiser. I have since postulated that the arachnid had made itself at home in the body of its hoof toast, feeding off its spinal fluid just long enough for it to plant a revolting sack of eggs. Robert's eyes widened with interest. Oh, what an intriguing yet, yet horrifying creature, Doctor. Perhaps the guide who fled into the night weren't as foolish as you say. Could you imagine what would happen if a thing like that was loose here in England? People would be quite in a panic. He and the old man shared a chuckle. The doctor took another sip of his tea. <laughs> Could I imagine, Robert? I dare say it already is. Dr. Tweedhead suddenly cocked back in a violent manner, terrible gagging noises emanating from his throat as blood began trickling from his eyes, ears, and nose. Eight long, spindly legs emerged from his mouth. <sighs> if you thought this episode was going to be an easy listen, you might want to reconsider. Or have more of this suspiciously colored vitamin water and breeze sinfully seasoned gingerbread. <laughs> I know I was stuffing my face while I was listening. There's something about voracious eating that eases the terror of unrestrained fear. As I mentioned before, my own real fear of spiders made even the production of this episode rather interesting on my nerves. I suppose in some subconscious way, I was trying to overcome my fear. But by now, as you already know, here is where your fears are not overcome, but exposed. <sighs> Look at me stalling, talking to delay the inevitable onslaught of tonight's fear. I suppose the only surest cure is deflection. Instead of dwelling on our gnawing fears, let me tell you a story of Dr. Rom and the terror that met her in the story regarding Eve. When they discovered Eve, the scientific community was buzzing. There had been instances of feral children throughout history, but none as odd as this. They found her in a mine shaft that had collapsed years before. No one cared much about the mine, until a new developer wanted it reopened. They certainly did not expect to find a child amongst the rubble. Her age was estimated to be between six and eight. Evacuators also found two human skeletons alongside her, presumably those of her parents. It was believed that her family had been exploring the mine when it collapsed, causing them to be confined in a space about the size of a large dining room. They most likely survived on rock condensation and insects. It was unknown how old Eve was when they became trapped. Her parents must have died rather quickly. Their skeletons showed years of decay. 
Despite this, it seemed that Eve was fond of rubbing the bones on her skin. Certain bones, including the woman's pelvis and the man's skull, were nearly polished when they were found. Eve showed no signs of being taught to walk or speak, although she did make skittering noises with her tongue. Instead of walking on two legs, she preferred walking on her hands. This made her palms extremely thick with calluses. When she walked, her spine curved so that her thighs were close to her head, similar to the tail of a scorpion. When she was discovered, she fought viciously to stay in her hole. It took two grown men three hours to pry her from the rocks. They came straight out of the encounter with a variety of bites and bruises. Eve screamed for two days straight, not stopping to sleep or drink. Finally, she collapsed from exhaustion. Everyone was thankful for the silence. There was much debate as to who would take Eve. Clearly, it had to be someone who understood abnormal child psychology. Many scientists fortunately threw their names in, but only one rose to the top. Henrietta Rom. She was a brilliant young woman with a PhD in degrees in psychology as well as biology, mathematics, and engineering. She was in the process of setting up the Rom Institute. This facility would specialize in studying childhood development in unique and traumatic cases. Eve fit the bill brilliantly. She was transported to the Institute, which was still in its infancy. Although the facility itself was incredibly large, only a few sectors were as yet in working order. One of these was the Athena Ward. This ward functioned as a home for severely traumatized children. It was fully staffed with nurses, caregivers, and psychologists. Although one couldn't exactly fit in to this population of misfits, Eve would at least find a suitable living arrangement. Henrietta was keen to observe every second of Eve's life. Her room was kept small. Three of the walls were padded, while the last appeared to be a dark black. This was, of course, a two-way mirror through which the scientists watched the girl. The room itself held few comforts. There was a cot with a thin mattress and pillow. In the corner was a small writing desk and chair. Otherwise, the room was completely empty. Eve's first day in the room was eventful. She woke up on the mattress after being sedated. Immediately, she flew off the bed and hid under the desk. The light from above seemed to burn her eyes. She stayed that way, crouched on her belly for hours. What was more, her eyes darted at every sound. Henrietta sat patiently behind the glass, watching. Finally, Eve crept out from under the desk. She walked as she usually did, on her hands. Her elbows were splayed, like an insect almost. She inspected the objects in her room with her mouth. She chewed on the wood desk and licked the metal of the cot. Eve seemed particularly disturbed by the cushion of the mattress. She grabbed it firmly with her feet and threw it against the wall. All the while she made these inhuman clicks with her mouth. Her head twitched constantly. She was never fully relaxed. She sniffed the padding of the wall, attempting to taste it. Realizing she couldn't wrap her teeth around anything, she started to climb. Her hands acted as claws as she scaled the side of the room. Her fingers bent in ways no ordinary humans could. She reached the very top where the wall met the ceiling. Henrietta watched silently as Eve began clicking louder. It sounded as though she was having a conversation. The clicking lasted a few more minutes before Eve dropped to the ground in a graceful leap, landing perfectly on her hands. She looked up directly into the black wall, directly into Henrietta's eyes. The next few days were odd to say the least. An orderly would enter three times a day to bring Eve her meals. She refused to eat anything that was prepared for her. Usually, she would hiss at the orderly and spill the food across the room. On the third day, Henrietta suggested changing her diet from the typical fare 
to a variety of insects. Fresh grasshoppers were brought in a plastic bag and left at Eve's door. Once the orderly had left, Eve descended upon the bag, ripping it open with her teeth and devouring the bugs in large, meaty chews. Henrietta decided that all of Eve's meals would now consist of insects. Everything was served from cockroaches to centipedes. Eve demolished each with no qualms. She even smiled when the meals were brought, a sight that looked strange on such a gaunt face. No attempts at therapy had been broached. Eve's violent nature and her distrust for humans made it difficult to even imagine sitting in the room with her. Plus, there was her clicking. She constantly climbed the walls and skittered incessantly. She was clearly communicating, but not even Henrietta could understand who the clicks were for. On the seventh day, the breakfast for Eve was a plastic bag full of spiders. The orderly left the bag by the door as usual, but this time Eve was utterly distraught. She cried out in what sounded like pain. Instead of hiding under the desk until the orderly left, Eve lashed out at him. She slashed his cheek with one of her razor-sharp toenails. Naturally, he screamed and pushed her away. Yet within seconds, she was standing on her hands again, ready to strike. Luckily, he made it out and shut the door before she could get to him. Henrietta did not react. She stared, transfixed, as Eve approached the bag. Eve had no interest in eating these creatures. Instead, she carefully used her teeth to rip a small hole in the bag. One by one, the spiders climbed out and onto her arms. Eve made her usual clicking noises, but also sounds of joy. It was almost like a regular child's laugh, except sharper. The arachnids swarmed her face, and she was practically giggling. There must have been nearly twenty spiders comfortably nestled in her hair and ears. Henrietta paged the orderly to come to her viewing room immediately. He appeared tired. A long red gash followed his forehead to his chin. Henrietta didn't even look at him. What kind of spider did you feed her? I, I, I don't know, Dr. Rom. Well, then you're useless. Find me someone with a brain. She waved him off. Henrietta could not take her eyes off the child, clicking happily as the spiders made their homes in her skin. When Dr. Rom wanted something, it never took long to appear. Within an hour, an expert on arachnids was at Henrietta's side. He was a nervous man who had no idea what to expect. When he saw Eve, he nearly ran out of the room. Your name? He jumped at Henrietta's voice. Uh, 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 Cooper. Uh, D Dave Cooper. Well, Dr. Cooper, Henrietta droned. I need to know what those spiders are. Dr. Cooper leaned in. It was a hard thing to look at. A six-year-old child walking on her hands across a room, covered in spiders. He lifted a magnifying glass out of his pocket and pressed it to the glass. I, uh, I, I would guess these spiders are wolf spiders. I don't care for guessing, she responded. Yes, uh, sorry. Those are wolf spiders. Definitely. He broke out in a sweat. Tell me more. Her voice was strong and impatient. Wolf spiders are fairly common in this area. These look to be on the large side, about one inch in diameter. He searched his brain for more facts. Oh, and they're also sometimes referred to as the most maternal arachnid. Maternal? Henrietta turned her back to the glass to stare at Dr. Cooper. Um, yeah. I mean, not in a human sense, of course. But female wolf spiders will carry their young on their backs until they are old enough to survive on their own. This kind of protective behavior is unheard of in arachnids. <laughs> there is no way to measure love in a spider, but if a spider could feel love, it would probably be a wolf spider. He had just finished his last word 
when an alarm sounded. Henrietta whirled round to see Eve's cell door open. The girl was gone. What the? An orderly ran in. Dr. Rom, we have no idea how she got out, but she's climbing the walls. We, we can't get to her. Henrietta stormed past him. Get the tranquilizer gun. She'll need to be moved to the Achilles ward. It took ten hours to capture Eve. She made it halfway across the facility, climbing the walls and the ceilings. Spiders of all sorts followed her from hallway to hallway. They rained down upon anyone who tried to get her. It was Henrietta herself who aimed the tranquilizer and shot Eve in the neck. The girl crashed to the ground, spiders scattering like rats. Her arms broke beneath her. As instructed, she was moved to the Achilles ward. Dr. Rom never mentioned her in public again. Upon inspection of Eve's room, ten dead spiders had jammed themselves into the door lock so Eve could escape. It wasn't just wolf spiders. There were four different species that had sacrificed themselves for her. In the next month, Henrietta had the entire institute fumigated. Nothing could have survived the amount of toxins she pumped through the walls. The Achilles ward was heavily restricted, so only a few had clearance to work there. Although many different kinds of screams came from those haunted rooms, no one heard any clicking. With all the spiders dead, there was no one to click to. Eve's noises, the only ones that allowed her to connect to another living creature, went completely unanswered. Scientists believed Eve had survived in that mine alone, but it was only after she was found that she experienced true solitude. From one gigantic spider possessing the consciousness of its victim to a feral spider girl, we're only two stories in, and may already have people running back to the cold confines of Castle Danielstein. But discomforting news, deserters. Cold rooms with little light are exactly the kinds of places the little beasts in our stories find homey. And from what I gather scientifically, most, if not all, spiders revile fire. So it's probably a good idea that you stay right here. Halfway done, but still halfway to go. Allow me to complete tonight's web of stories by telling you our third and perhaps most subtly chilling of all, Tainted Candy. I won't let my kids trick-or-treat this Halloween. Not after what happened last year. Not when half the town's parents are still in mourning, and every week you see cribs and twin-sized beds by the curb for anyone to come by and pick up. They're stark reminders that the losses cut deep around here. The pain's still here, and even if those wounds have started to heal for some, they'll always, always itch. Last year, kids received tainted candy. 55 got sick, 31 died. It was all over the news, so I don't need to go into a background story that you already know. My girls, thank God, were lucky. They're both allergic to peanuts, so they just gave the candies to their friends. Friends they don't have anymore. I remember my shift in the ER, where the kids started trickling in. It took a few days. The first one was on November 3rd, a four-year-old girl named Regina. She was having trouble breathing. At first I thought it was an allergic reaction, but none of the treatments seemed to work. As she got worse, it was only after we scoped her to get a look inside her lungs that we realized what was happening. By then, though, it was too late. She died on the table. Three more young kids came in that night. They, too, all died. 
The next day the trickle became a flood. Older kids joined the younger ones, all with trouble breathing. These seemed worse off than the kids the night before. The initial symptoms had given way to the secondary ones before death, so we had to deal with the shock and terror they were experiencing as their condition progressed. The CDC representatives arrived not long after ten more had died, and they were able to quickly trace the source to the contaminated candy. The local chocolate producer was determined to be at fault, and a speedy investigation revealed how exactly the candies were contaminated. The business was shut down. The owners are still tied up in court cases for their negligence and refusal to comply with proper importation safeguards. Like I said, after a year it's all still fresh in the minds of so many families. They will go their whole lives associating this holiday with death and devastation rather than fun and excitement. Out of respect for that, few yards are decorated for Halloween nowadays. There are some pumpkins on front steps, but no real displays. Well, there'd be that one. A Japanese family, who moved to town in August, had been mostly unaware of the circumstances surrounding the tragedy. They'd bought the house across the street from me. Excited to celebrate Halloween in America for the first time, they decorated their front lawn with skeletons, pumpkins, monsters, spiders, everything you can imagine. A couple of neighbors visited them the next day and carefully explained what had happened the year before. The decorations were down within an hour. It wasn't that anyone was truly angry that the decorations were there. Most of them were fine. Had they just left three or four things up, no one would have complained. Hell, some people lucky enough to have been touched by the tragedies might have appreciated a little Halloween spirit. But for some, seeing that one thing was just too much. Even I, who haven't lost anyone, cringed a little when I saw the setup. It made me think back to the night on November 3rd when Regina came into the ER. I remember the scope going down into her lungs. I remember how we stared at the screen in a combination of horror and fascination. It wasn't a skeleton or pumpkin or a monster that had killed these children. It was the spiders. The millions of tiny black spiders whose eggs had been in the cocoa powder decorating the finished chocolate and peanut butter candies. The kids who suffocated before the spiders had exited their lungs were the lucky ones. It was those in the waiting room or car or ambulance who hacked and coughed up clouds of them as they died who had it the worst. The Japanese family apologized profusely as they removed all the decorations. It was obvious they were mortified. As I watched them out of the front window, I saw Gichi wave his wife eye over to get a closer look at the front lawn. Her eyes widened as she put her hand over her mouth. I couldn't see what they were looking at, but I knew what it was. Ever since last November, there have been webs all over the place. They're small, only about the size of a quarter, but immediately recognizable as being those of some Honduran spider that had been accidentally imported by the chocolate shop owners. The town's infested with them. I try not to get too close to the corners and eaves of my house, because I know they're there. Harmless, but there. Just another cruel reminder, one of many. I haven't touched a piece of chocolate in over 350 days. I dread having to use the scope when I'm at work in the ER. And nearly every night, I dream about how it all happened, only to jolt awake with the feeling of spiders squirming through my lungs. Dear God, if you brought candy to tonight's episode, especially if it is chocolate, there's the fire. In it must go. Uh, I swear I didn't inject spider eggs into it, nor is anyone else here. Uh, I hope. 
Remember, it is that damned factory and their negligence that is responsible. So, if, if whatever you brought was produced there, it must burn. Since ancient days, fire has been reputed as a purifier of all that is good and evil. Blessing for the wise, damnation for the unrepentant. But now, it is time for our final story this evening. The campfire wanes, the moon waxes, our time grows short. Let me leave you with a sinister account about a very unrepentant man and his creeping secret. Gather round the last embers for... Spiders. Spiders are an incredibly unique creature. Ever since I was a child, they've held my fascination like no other arthropod could. Did you know that spiders are the largest and most diverse subdivision of arachnids? So much that I bet you can't even name another type of arachnid other than a spider. Go ahead. It's hard, isn't it? <laughs> That's alright. I'll give you a hand. Arachnids, to put it simply, are not like insects. They don't have any wings or antennae, and their bodies are separated into two tagmata, the cephalothorax and the abdomen. The scorpion, mite, and tick are all arachnids, but the spider is the most diverse of all. In fact, spiders are the seventh most diverse organism in existence, having over 45,700 different species. Imagine that, 45,700 different types of spider, each one distinctly different, each one a beautiful little monster. There are spiders on every single continent in the world, well, except Antarctica, but why would any spiders want to live there? A spider really can live anywhere, though, because they carry around the tools they need to build their home everywhere they go. Could you envision that? Perhaps you decide to go on a vacation, and once you're there you think, well, this is nicer than home, perhaps I'll stay. So you get out your tools and build a home right then and there. <laughs> Spiders truly are incredibly adaptive. Spiders eject silk from their appendages on their abdomen, which they use to create webs of all different shapes and sizes. The webs, although always a bit unique, follow a specific pattern and form depending on the particular species of spider. Some spiders' webs look almost like snowflakes with lovely spindles of silk crossing over itself to make various patterns, while other spiders' webs look more like a swirling cone of silk. All of the webs are striking and beautiful, much like their residents. Spiders are predators, well, except for the Bagheera kiplingi, which is a herbivore and shouldn't count as a spider. But unfortunately no one listens to my opinion when it comes to categorizing spiders. However, every other species of spider is a predator. The most well-known way spiders capture their prey is by using a web. The spider will place their web based on the type of prey in the area. Some spiders weave very small webs, which they stretch and release to target specific prey. Some weave even smaller, teeny tiny webs, hold them out between their first two pairs of legs, then charge and push the web as much as twice their own body length to trap the prey. And some spiders, like tarantulas, lure their prey in with trap doors, surrounded by strands of silk, to alert them to their prey's presence. I suppose I must relate to this type of spider. I lure my prey into my trap, whether it be a pizza delivery guy, UPS, or even the rare Jehovah's Witness who comes knocking. The motion sensors at my door let me know when someone has arrived, just like the spider's silk trip lines. And then I simply remove the bar from underneath the door on my porch, and my game falls right in to my web. 
From there, I treat my prey just as a spider would. I wrap them up nice and tight. Since I don't have any of my own silken strands, I have to use a combination of rope and cling wrap. But it does the trick. Once they're bound, we play all sorts of fun games. I know I really shouldn't play with my food, but it's just so, so fun. <laughs> so fun. I love the way they scream and scream and scream. <laughs> No one will ever hear them. My web is soundproof, so they can scream all they like. And oh, do I love to make them scream. I hang them from the ceiling, usually by their feet, and let all kinds of bugs crawl down the web. After all, even though my web is for big prey, some small treats make a tasty appetizer. My prey will scream and cry and beg me to let them go while bugs crawl over every inch of their bound bodies. But I don't let them go. I wouldn't be a very good spider if I did that. Once they start to get boring, and they always eventually do. It's time to eat. I haven't figured out how to liquefy my prey in true spider fashion just yet. But a liquid diet is important for a growing spider. So instead I slit their throat and collect it in a bucket. And that holds me over for at least a little while. Spiders, as you know, don't have teeth. And so neither do I so I have to find creative ways to get the nutrition I need. Usually small bugs don't need chewing. I just swallow them whole and wash them down with blood. Unfortunately, I still have a great deal to figure out about my full spider transformation, which is why I'm writing this post. I'm hoping that if I post this here, I might be able to get into contact with a, a doctor. You see, spiders have eight legs. I only have two. Well, I do have six other legs. I just need someone to attach them. If anyone can help, send me a message. No price is too high. After all, even spiders have their ways of making money. I suppose we all have our hobbies. His was tying up his victims tight and watching them scream. Though my hamburgers have never screamed, I don't believe it is out of the realm of possibility. Peter might say the beef still echoes with the cry of the innocent dead. Perhaps another subject for a chilling episode of the show. Ah, but there goes the campfire. And since Orko was not here to tend it as I read, it has all but expired on us. I believe we should all return to our respective abodes until next time, friends. As they say, when the light goes out, soon emerge the creatures of doubt. And as we are in an old forest, of a vampire no less, one hardly knows what lurks beneath centuries of pine needle, leaf, lichen, and earth. Keep a weather eye on your digital mailboxes and social media for my next invitation to Season 1, Episode 3 of Nothing But Fear. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet, for even more horror. Though I suspect some of you will spend tonight's remaining hours either huddled in a fort of sheets with your flashlight or madly exterminating every last creeping thing your house conceals. Till next time, listeners. Forgive me if I haven't allayed what dread you brought with you into this wood. Not that there is much I can do about it anyway. For here, there is nothing but fear. <laughs>